Our final step of cellular respiration is oxidative phosphorylation. Oxidative phosphorylation is where we actually have what we call a high energy loss of electrons. So we're going to go through oxidation, which is the loss of electrons. Those electrons are coming from those energy intermediate molecules, NADH and FADH2, and that's going to help to create ATP. Really large numbers of ATP, right? A net amount of 32, which we have not seen numbers this high so far. And the oxidative phosphorylation step is comprised of two different components. One is called ETC, which stands for electron transport chain. And the final one is ATP synthase. So the electron transport chain is essentially uh, these proteins that follow in a series, right? One by one by one. And what they do is they have a big job in helping to transfer electrons from one protein to the next. So if you see the first portion of this picture shows you the electron transport chain. So you have molecules like NADH or molecules like FADH2, which are not pictured here. What happens is these proteins allow that hydrogen or that oxidation to occur so that we can pump proteins into this space here. So what we're going to eventually do is create a gradient that has a high amount of proteins at the top and the proteins are coming from these energy intermediates at the bottom. So again, electron transport chain, we're transporting electrons along the way. And how do we get those electrons? From our molecules NADH and FADH2, which is not pictured here. All of this occurs in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So again, nothing different than you've seen before, but this occurs within the mitochondria. So let me give you a, a small visual of kind of what's happening. So let me draw a little bit of a membrane here. Within this membrane, you're going to have these different proteins. So I'm going to try to draw some proteins that are transmembrane proteins, right? So they're, they're spanning across the length of the membrane. What happens is at the bottom, you're going to have molecules like NADH or let's say FADH2. And those molecules are eventually going to be oxidized. So they'll turn into things like NAD plus or FAD plus, which I'm not expecting you to learn that. But I do want you to recognize that all of those little hydrogens that were once attached to FADH or NADH, they're now going to be shot up or pushed up these transport proteins to create a gradient of hydrogen molecules. So you'll have tons of hydrogen molecules over time that end up at the very top. That's going to create a gradient, which we will use to our advantage later. So the electron transport chain is where we're talking about transporting these electrons from these energy intermediate molecules at the bottom and pushing them up towards this space at the top. I'm going to come back to this image because we'll use it for the second part. So again, a great way to look at this is this picture here. I like this picture, but the bad part is it's kind of sideways. So this is the bottom of the transport protein in which you have NADH and FADH. And then as we uh, push the hydrogens up, this is the gradient. So this portion of the image here is similar to this portion of the image that I drew. So it's, it's kind of weird why they have it kind of tilted. Okay, so again, those high energy electrons are going to be donated from NADH or FADH2 to this electron transport chain, which are the series of proteins down the line. This is going to create a gradient of proteins, right? So then you're going to have a large amount of proteins. We've done this before, okay? We've done something in which you've seen us go from high to low. We know things flow from high to low. So we're creating a high amount, a high amount of hydrogen ions at the top because eventually we want them 
to start to flow from high to low, okay? So one thing to keep in mind here is because we're going to eventually start pumping these hydrogen molecules throughout these membranes, you're going to have a few hydrogen molecules that are just floating around. Those hydrogen molecules are floating around, but they need somewhere to go. Where do they go? Oxygen. Folks, this is why we need oxygen. When we breathe, we need oxygen because if we do not have oxygen, you have no place for the hydrogen molecules to go. They will eventually form H2O, okay? So they're going to form H2O and the oxygen that we inhale every day needs to be at the very bottom of this chain so that when the hydrogen molecules eventually need somewhere to land, they can interact with the oxygen and form H2O as a byproduct. So if you take a second, I put a picture of the cellular respiration process at the bottom. I want y'all to understand, again, like I said, this is why we need oxygen. At the very beginning of the process, we use glucose. You've seen us use glucose the entire time. We also know that as humans, we need oxygen and we need it to breathe. This is why, because it needs to be present for this final step. You may have also noticed one of the products of cellular respiration is carbon dioxide, which we have already shown you, or I have already shown you how each of those carbon dioxide molecules are being produced throughout the process. But this is where H2O comes from, right? We're producing H2O in cellular respiration from where? Where is it coming from? It's coming from this step right here. We need oxygen in the beginning. We have hydrogen molecules we got from our energy intermediates. They're going to combine and produce H2O. If you zoom in, you can see that H2O right um, next to this green protein. You see the oxygen that we have in our bodies. You see the hydrogen ions that are coming from some of those energy immediates up top, and then you see the H2O that we're producing. I want you guys to be very clear about where each of these components are coming from and where each of these components are being used. That is very, very important. That is something that you can expect. This is also an application-based question. So make sure that you're familiar with how each of these components are being used or how we create them throughout the process. Okay, so again, with that oxidative phosphorylation, long story short, we are donating hydrogen ions from our NADHs or FADH2s that we produce. They're shooting up to create a um, high concentration of hydrogens, and they will eventually come down, and I'm going to talk about that in a second, um, which is going to produce ATP, and in the meantime, any spare hydrogen ions will be um, interacting with the oxygen to form H2O. So like I said, we are essentially creating this high concentration of hydrogens. That high concentration of hydrogens has a term or a name, which is the hydrogen electrochemical gradient or proton gradient. And again, this is going to provide energy for that next step. So just to tell you the terminology for that high concentration of hydrogens are these two terms here in bold. So ATP synthase, really simple. This is the enzyme that's actually going to make or synthesize ATP at the very end of the electron transport chain. So remember, our electron transport chain are the little proteins that we had um, within the membrane that are going to allow hydrogen molecules to uh, create this gradient up top, right? So now you have a lot of hydrogen molecules up here that we got from FADH2 or NADH. Now they're going to run through something like a uh, windmill. So eventually they're going to run through this ATP synthase. And as they run through it, it's going to cause this ATP synthase to spin. As it spins, it creates ATP energy. 
Y'all know what a windmill looks like, right? Or a wind turbine. As it spins from the wind, it's going to create energy. So as all of the hydrogen molecules flow through ATP synthase, this ATP synthase will begin to spin. And as it spins, it causes ATP to be produced. The production of this ATP as a result of the hydrogen ions going through the synthase, it's called chemiosmosis. What does chemiosmosis look like? It looks like chemical osmosis. Normally, osmosis is the flow of water from high to low, but chemiosmosis is the flow of chemicals, or in this case, ions, from high to low. So just keep that in mind. The term chemiosmosis is that creation of ATP as a result of pushing those hydrogen ions through that ATP synthase. Again, these, this is the image I was trying to draw. <laughs> um, you see throughout this process, the first part here, so these uh, four purple proteins are going to be very similar to our electron transport chain. We are producing or oxidizing these molecules and creating hydrogen ions. These hydrogen ions are creating this uh, proton gradient or high amount of hydrogen ions at the top. Then after we have those hydrogen ions at the top of our image, they're going to flow through this ATP synthase. This ATP synthase will spin. As it spins, it's going to create ATP molecules, 32 as a matter of fact, 32 ATP molecules it will create. Once it is done with that, those hydrogens can now interact with that oxygen that's present to form H2O. So again, energy intermediates donate hydrogens. They create a gradient. The hydrogens flow through ATP synthase, which creates 32 molecules of ATP. The hydrogen ions that are present, they will interact with the oxygen and then give us H2O. So again, I want to show you that cellular respiration process. This is the conclusion of cellular respiration process, the very last stage, the one that requires oxygen and the one that's going to produce the most amount of ATP. But as you look at this, I hope you have a new lens because you can really truly track the movement of all of these molecules. Why do we have six molecules of glucose? Where do they go? How do those six molecules of glucose relate to the six carbons that are present? How did we form H2O? Why do we need oxygen? Where do we make the most ATP? Where do we make the least ATP? All of these are questions you can really ask yourself. And then my final closing thought about this is that just because we initially uh, do this entire process with glucose, I want you to know that other macromolecules that you have seen or that you eat especially can be used in this process. So you can get energy from carbohydrates like glucose, but also things like proteins and fat. Um, if you eat something that has high proteins or fat, the only thing is that it will enter glycolysis or the citric acid cycle at different places. So we've just been talking about carbohydrates all the way down, but let's say you are on a keto diet, which is mostly fats and proteins or Let's say you're watching your carbohydrates for whatever reason. You can still create energy, but these different macromolecules will just jump in the cycle at different places. They use the same pathways, but they just uh, begin the pathways at different parts. So I want to make sure that you all know that you're not required to eat a full glucose diet. You can have other foods in your diet as well. Okay, so that concludes our cellular respiration series and if you have any questions please make sure to take very good notes this again is where you learn so this portion of class is where you're learning information and then in class we're going to be able to apply it so please keep your questions uh, prepared and i will see you in our next class period